Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship at Blythe Road Baptist Church this Sunday, the 28th day of March. It's the last Sunday of March, and of course, it's Palm Sunday. And this morning, we are going to be looking at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and the symbolic action that Jesus takes on that day. It's also, of course, the first day of Holy Week. And as far as announcements go, I want to let you all know that we will be worshiping God together this Good Friday. We will be remembering this Good Friday. And there'll be a service available at 1030 on Friday morning. And uh, we will come around the Lord's table at the end of that service. You'll be able to do that, that online. On Easter Sunday, of course, we are going to be uh, worshiping again uh, at 1030. Uh, there will be the Lord's Supper as part of that service as well. And, uh, and we will also gather on Zoom. So next Sunday, if you're able to, to gather with us uh, at noon uh, via Zoom, we'll be coming around the Lord's table again that way. I want to mention as well, um, if you are able to help with the delivery of Easter plants, we're going to be doing some Easter plant deliveries next weekend. If you're able to help us with that, do please get in touch with the church office. As we prepare our hearts for worship this morning, friends, let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious and merciful God, as we prepare to worship you this day and this week, we ask that you would help us as we call to mind these events in Jesus' life so that we can know their significance in our present and so that we can know, Lord, their significance in the future that you are preparing for all of creation. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hear the call to worship, friends. The Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to daughter Zion, see your salvation comes, your reward is with him, and your recompense goes before him. Let's praise God together in song, friends. Let us sing Hosanna in the highest. Let's sing.
Children play a significant role in the kingdom of God, and they play a significant role in the story that we are going to hear this morning as well. And this next song that we're going to do is, uh, is particularly for the children. It's called Hosanna to the King. So this one is for little Ethan and Vince and Jonah and Oliver and Faith and Elias and Nathaniel and Nyla and Noah and Nate and Cammy and all the children who are maybe not known to us, but they're known to God and they're loved by God. So join us as we sing Hosanna, na, 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 na. Lift our hands and our voices and sing. Let's sing. Our scripture reading this morning, friends, is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm going to be reading Matthew chapter 21, verse 1 through to verse 17. Let's hear the word of the Lord. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! 
When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared praise for yourself. He left them, went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. And this is the word of the Lord, and we thank God for the reading of it and for the hearing of it this day. So we're coming to the crux of the matter, friends. Quite literally, the crux. We're coming to the cross. And this morning, the cry that we hear is Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And, and the, that word Hosanna, it, it literally means, it's a cry for help. It literally means save us. Save us, we pray, or, or save us, we plead. A cry for help. And we remember from not long ago, the question that was posed by the followers of John the Baptist to Jesus. And they said, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? In other words, are you the one to save us? And this is assuming, of course, that we think that we're in need of saving, assuming that we think that we're in need of help at all, which is in no way a safe assumption. We may think we're doing quite all right. Thank you very much. The status quo might be working out quite well for us, particularly if, if we hold some degree of power, or some degree of means. And it often seems to go that way for many. But as we also said a couple of weeks ago, uh, how well are we really doing? And if we're at all familiar with the news, of course, we may find ourselves wondering uh, just how well the status quo is going. And as we do each year, we're marking Palm Sunday. And you'll have noticed as I read the story that there's no, there's no mention of palms in, in Matthew's account. Matthew talks about the people cutting branches of trees. It's actually only John who writes about palms. Uh, any tree branch might do seemingly, which is why I have some tree branches kind of strewn around the table. And I'll, I'll come back to that a little later on. Uh, the question might be asked, why do we do this? And, and this whole scene that we're looking at this morning is, is filled with symbolic action. And you know, if you've been around me for any length of time, you know that I'm a big believer in symbolic action. I like symbolic action, whether it's, it's lighting a candle or, or, or gathering around the table that, that Christ invites us to. I like big symbolic action. I like, I like big bread at the communion table. Um, I like a lot of water when we're baptizing, which is it's a good thing. Probably I'm a Baptist. I like symbolic action. And this morning in the story that we hear from Matthew, Jesus engages in symbolic action. And we'll see that it was, it was localized action. It, it, it was action that, that was unknown to the city at large, much as we could say our, our actions with, with our palm fronds and our decorations and, and putting our palm fronds on our doors and so on, might be largely unknown. Our symbolic action might be largely ignored by those around us and, and might not seem to have meaning for, for many people. And um, really, they don't have any meaning outside of the one of whom we're asking the question as we go through these weeks of Lent and as we'll continue on. Uh, through the weeks of Eastertide, after Easter, God willing, we're asking the question, what sort of man is this? What sort of man is this? And this morning, we find that he is the one who enters the city of David on a donkey, along with her colt. Not even two full-size donkeys, but a donkey and her colt. And I was doing some research on this over this past week, and 
And, and you may know that I, I have a thing for donkeys. I like donkeys. I have a certain kind of affinity for donkeys. I'm not sure why. I just really like them. But uh, a colt, a donkey colt, is a donkey that is one to four years of age. Uh, a donkey that's younger than that is called a foal. Um, what you might call a baby donkey is called a foal. Uh, anyway, a colt is from one to four years of age. And apparently donkeys don't get to full size until they're three to five years of age. So we've got this picture of Jesus riding with a donkey and her colt. And I want, I've told this story before, but I, I want to tell it again, so please permit me um, as we're worshiping in a bit more of a public way than we usually are. But Nicole and I were in, were in Petra, we were in Jordan rather, um, some years ago, and we were visiting Petra. And at the end of the day, um, we, we engaged a, sort of a Bedouin uh, taxi donkey service, and, and they were going to take us back to the hotel via donkey and then, and then via pickup truck. And as we were uh, sorting out the donkeys, arranging the donkeys, I was worried that the donkey might not be able to hold me. And uh, the man who was in charge, he yelled out, he said, get this man a mule. And he was kidding. Of course, the donkey could hold me. They were well able to do that. But as we went along, I was wanting to feel uh, something like Clint Eastwood. I wanted to feel all cool like Eastwood in High Plains Drifter as we went along, particularly given the, 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 particularly given the terrain that we were in. Uh, however, the fact remained that I was on a donkey and there was nothing really very cool or, or regal or powerful feeling about being on a donkey. And Matthew tells us that this took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble, and mounted on a donkey and on a colt the foal of a donkey. Now our NRSV Bible has used the word here humble to match what, what the Hebrew version of Zephaniah says about, about the king coming humble. But the word that, act, that Matthew uses actually is the Greek word that's used in the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. And the amazing thing is the, the word that Matthew actually uses is the word gentle. Your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey, which must make us think back to those words we heard two, two, two weeks ago, that lovely invitation, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And we said, of course, that, that when we accept that invitation to take Jesus' yoke, the yoke of the one who is gentle and humble in heart, that in doing so, we find out what freedom is, we find out what it means to be free. So this is the man who was on a donkey walking down the road. As that children's song we sang earlier goes. And freedom, as Jesus goes along the road, freedom is very much on people's minds. It's Passover time. The biggest festival of them all. A remembrance of God setting a people free. And the city is, is full of people. It's thronged with people. And Jesus has once again come down from the mountain. He's come down from Mount Olivet. And here's a little, a little map of it, because we haven't looked at a map in a little while, it seems. But Mount Olivet is to the east of Jerusalem. And uh, he's come down from the mountain. And, and this is where it's thought that they would have stayed during Passover. Mount Olivet would have presented a, a, a place for people to camp, almost like a, a modern day campground. And before we come to the story of Jesus entering Jerusalem, we, we found at the end of Matthew 20, we read of Jesus healing two blind men. And they cry out to, them, to him. They say, have mercy on us, Lord, son of David. And we read, Matthew tells us, Jesus was moved with compassion. And he touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and they followed him. There's no longer any need for Jesus to tell people to keep quiet about it. Or, or not to say things like son of David for fear of the clash that might ensue with the authorities. The time for the clash is here. And, and Jesus is taking his mission public in a new way. The time for talk, you might say, is over. And, and, and now is the time for action. Of course, there will still be talking. Remember when we, when we started um, going through Matthew, we talked about how Matthew 1 to 4, chapters 1 to 4, uh, talked largely about who Jesus is, deal with his identity. Uh, chapters 5 to 16, 
deal largely with what he says and then uh, chapter 17 on deal largely with what he does and of course there's saying and doing in, in all of the sections but here we're looking at what Jesus does in particular and Jesus tells his followers he says go into Bethpage where they'll find a mother donkey and her colt and whether this was supernatural knowledge that Jesus had or whether he had, had simply made arrangements we don't know but we know that Jesus is in control here of the situation. And the symbolism is rich. Uh, it's a donkey that had never been ridden and animals that had not been ridden or used in any way were often used in, for sacred purposes. And, and branches and cloaks are being spread on the ground because this is how you greeted a king, a king who'd be riding in on a war horse having vanquished his people's enemies and at long last given them freedom. And we like that image. We like that image of a conquering king on a war horse. It's conventional wisdom. Of course, as we said throughout, as we've been saying throughout these weeks, Jesus is turning conventional wisdom upside down. But this makes me want to pose another question, this, this talking, talking about freedom. And the question is, where is freedom to be found? Where, where in the world? Or with whom in the world? Do we find freedom? In my own lifetime, we once heard that, that freedom was to be found at, at 55 years of age. Is freedom to be found in financial security? Is it to be found in national security? Is it to be found in the ability of the individual to pursue whatever he or she wants to or feels led to pursue? Is that freedom? Are my individual rights and freedoms the, things, the thing that takes precedence, precedence over everything else? Is freedom to be found in, uh, in the security of religious rituals? And I want us to hang on to that thought for a little while. But Jesus comes into Jerusalem at the end of the year when religious and nationalist fervor, it's the time of year when religious and nationalist fervor is at an all-time high and dreams of freedom are at an all-time high. And many of us are familiar with, with Jewish first century expectations of a Messiah. There was an expectation that the Messiah would free them from Roman rule by force of arms. And when you're living under oppressive occupation, of course, this is understandable. So while all this is going on, we have Jesus riding into town, riding into the city on this donkey. And people are shouting, they're saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And that question that was posed by John the Baptist's followers, it's being answered by these followers of Jesus, even though they didn't fully understand it. And it's not like we fully understand it even now. But these followers of Jesus are crying Hosanna. They're crying, save now, save us, son of David. Save us, our king, this king who was mounted on a donkey, this Prince of Peace who is riding into the city named after peace. This Prince of Peace who is going to show that the way to freedom is going to look like something that's maybe different from what we were expecting. So as this is happening, the question of the day is what will save you or in whom or what do you find your freedom? Or how about in whom or in what do you find your peace? And friends, the response that Matthew is inviting us into, the response that is true for so many, the response that is true for me, is in this man who is riding into town with this donkey and her colt. This man whose symbolic action of riding this donkey into the city points to something beyond the symbol. Just as symbolic action of prophets who went before him pointed to something beyond the action. This man who is making God's ways known. This man who is bringing the word of God. And people say, who is this? And something seismic is happening here. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee comes the answer. And this is what prophets do. They make God's ways known. 
they bring God's words. And Jesus here is our prophet par excellence. He is our king par excellence. He is the king in whom righteousness reigns. He is the king who rules with justice. And so we say, why do we do this year after year? And why do we bring the palm fronds out and, and the branches and the songs and the cries of Hosanna? Why do we keep doing this year after year? We do it to come before this humble king, to come before this gentle king and to say and to cry out, save now, to, to cry out, I need help, to cry out for him to save us. Because I don't know about you, but I find myself consistently and constantly in need of saving. No matter what else is on offer, or no matter what other claims are being made in terms of what might save me or what might give me freedom. And friends, I want us to think about this in Jesus' symbolic action this Palm Sunday as we think of the cross. And as we think of the question, what sort of man is this? And as we come to the crux, quite literally on Friday, we are going to come to the crux of the matter. What sort of man is this is the question. And the short answer is this is the man who is going to take the single most significant symbolic action in the history of the world. And he's going to do that on the cross. Now, that's not the whole meaning of the cross, of course. We could never come to an end of understanding the meaning of the cross and the mystery of the cross and plumbing the depths. And, 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 and the world itself could not contain the books that should be written or that could be written about the meaning of the cross. But this is definitely one of them. Jesus is going to show what God's love looks like on the cross and God's love looks like self-sacrificing, forgiving, grace-filled love. We're going to remember this on a, in a special way, of course, on Friday, and I hope you can join us. But we don't just remember on Friday. We remember all the time. He's the man who's going to bring us back to God, the man who will show that freedom is not to be found fundamentally in getting our own way, the, the man who is going to provide a way for us to live in communion with. God and in worship of the living God who's the compassionate one and the gracious one and the merciful one and the forgiving one and the loving one and this is why we do this so my dear friends let us spread our cloaks on the road metaphorically at least and let us strew our branches I've strewn these branches here on the table and 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 how often do you get to use a word like strew or or strewn let's take our palm branches if you can get a palm branch or if you have some branches around strew them around to remind us to take this symbolic action to remind us of our gentle king and of course, to call Jesus king is to submit to Jesus' authority. And we talked about this a few weeks ago too. Jesus' parabolic action, Jesus' symbolic action does not stop with this action with the donkey, with riding into the, the city on this donkey. We read that Jesus entered uh, Jerusalem and he entered on the east side. And again, going back to the map, we see when you enter the east side, the temple is right there. The temple was huge. So we read, then Jesus entered the temple. And we've talked about Jesus' role as prophet, Jesus' role as, 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 as the prophet who makes God's ways known, who brings the word of God. We've talked about Jesus as our king, the one who reigns in righteousness and rules with justice. And I want us to think a little now about Jesus as our priest. Our priest par excellence, the one who not only mediates the presence of God, but the one who is the presence of God, the one who purifies our worship, the one through whom we can worship God. And this purification is again seen symbolically in Jesus' actions as he goes and he overturns the tables. He causes a disruption. The temple was a huge place. As I said, it took up a lot of land. And the court of the Gentiles, it was a large place, and it would have been thronged with people, particularly at this time of year. And there's no reason to believe that the actions of one man would have disrupted the whole thing. 
any more than me tipping over a, a mushroom display in the produce section of my supermarket would disrupt the actions of the entire supermarket. Of course, it would disrupt the actions of those around me and they'd be calling for a cleanup in produce. But Jesus is disrupting things. Jesus' coming is causing seismic changes and things are being disrupted. Including things like finding our security, finding our freedom in religious practices. Now, this is not to say, of course, that religious practices are bad. Don't get me wrong. We're encouraged to engage in practices religiously, and I, and I do that myself. This is not to say that Jesus is signifying here that the temple is bad or that the sacrificial system was bad. Jesus said he came to fulfill, remember, not to destroy. He came to be the person to whom the temple pointed, the very presence of God, the one who would mediate between humanity and God, the sacrifice who would bring all things back to God, the presence of God, and the one by whose presence through his spirit we would be called temples of God. The presence of God indwelling in us, that's amazing. But getting back to our scene, the temple tax, there was a temple tax and it needed to be paid in local currency. So people needed to change money. People were coming from all over. They needed to change the money into the, their money into the local currency. And we read about doves, and, and doves were sold so that people who didn't have a lot of means could take part in, in the sacrificial system with, with the dove. And there was nothing in and of itself wrong with this. And, and many say, they, they look at this passage, and there's nothing wrong with this. It, it's not spelt out, but, but people say that, that Jesus is protesting unfair business practices here. In other words, charging more, charging people more than what the currency exchange rate called for, or charging more for doves to buy a dove inside the temple than you might be able to get outside, I guess kind of like getting a hot dog in the baseball game in the ballpark as opposed to buying one from a vendor on the street. And there's merit to this view, of course, and, and the Bible is clear on speaking out against economic exploitation. But there's another way to see this, and, and, and New Testament uh, scholar, theologian, pastor, N.T. Wright, he puts it like this in his commentary. He says, behind all the trappings of the temple, Jesus could see that the whole place and the whole city had come to symbolize the determination of Israel to do things their own way. In particular, to embrace a vision of God and God's kingdom, which was fundamentally different from the vision he was announcing and living out. And I want us to take a look at this passage from Jeremiah 7, and, and, and Matthew is alluding to this passage. But listen to what Jeremiah the prophet says, speaking for God. He says, will you steal, this is a, Jeremiah 7, verses 9 to 11. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come to stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are saved only to go on doing all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? And another commentator, they, they talk about this passage like this. They say the allusion to Jeremiah suggests that the market represents to Jesus the secularization of the temple by worshipers. Note that buyers and sellers are both driven out here. I'll start that again. The allusion to Jeremiah suggests that the market represents to Jesus the secularization of the temple by worshipers whose lives do not conform with their religious profession, but who claim nonetheless to find security in their religiosity, who say, as the prophet Jeremiah said, we are safe. But their lives do not conform with their religious profession. So this Holy Week, friends, as we enter it, if we haven't been doing this already, and I, I hope that we ha if we have, let us continue. If we haven't, let us start. But let us examine ourselves and let us mourn how the things that Christ announced and the things that Christ lived out are not lived out by us. Let us ask the question of ourselves, in what ways in my life, in what ways does my life not conform with my religious profession? 
Let us ask ourselves the question, in what ways do we, do we see our faith as a way to become entrenched in our own views and in our own ways, rather than being remade by our faith, rather than being remade by the Spirit? And remember that when we examine ourselves like this, we do this in a place of grace. We do this remembering the words of Christ who said, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed, blessed are those who mourn the ways that they go wrong. Blessed are us when we mourn the ways that we go wrong because we do so knowing that we, we mourn to a God who is gracious and merciful and forgiving and who will remake us. We do so remembering Christ, our healer. And we do so remembering this wonderful postscript to the story. I said at the beginning of our service that children play an important role in this story and the kids are great. And, uh, and here they are. We come to this, 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 this postscript almost to the story. We read that the blind and the lame came to Jesus in the temple and he cured them. People who were once deemed unworthy are welcomed and they're included. People who were excluded are included. And we can say, I once was blind, but Jesus is causing me to see. I once was blind, but Jesus is giving me eyes to see. I once was lame, but Jesus is teaching me how to walk. And in being a disciple of Christ and being a student of Christ, I'm learning how to walk. And I'm learning how to see. What a wonderful thing. We are being healed. We needed help. And the man to give us help has ridden into town on a donkey. And he's here to give it. And the children know. The children understand. The children know their need for help. And it's not for nothing, as I said recently, that, that Jesus said, unless we become like little children, we won't enter the kingdom of heaven because little children know their need for help. And the little children are, are calling out. And they're in the temple. And people must have been saying, how did those kids even get in here? And they're crying out. They're saying, Hosanna to the son of David. And they're praising Jesus. They're praising the king. Save us, please, son of David. The children are crying out. Save us, son of David, our prophet, our king, our great high priest. And so, friends, may the symbolic actions we take this day and in the days to come remind us of these great truths and may they remind us of our gentle king. Amen. As we respond to God's word, friends, we're going to sing and we're going to sing a song which is called Imagine. And it's not uh, asking us to imagine in a uh, wouldn't it be nice kind of way but it's asking us to imagine in a, in a wondrous way, in wonderment and to imagine a king who would come through the darkness, who would walk where we walk, full of greatness, who would call us his child. So let's, uh, let's sing together.
As we continue to respond to God's word, friends, we're going to come before God with the prayers of God's people. Let's pray. God, whose gracious love for us embraced that long and lonely journey to the cross, gather us close to you in these days when again we make that journey in meditation and recollection. Help us to contemplate again the way taken by our Savior, the false charges against him, the fear and flight of the disciples, the kiss of betrayal, the crown of thorns, the purple robe, and in such contemplation, give us courage to face those times in our own lives when he received the same at our hands. Yet help us also to remember that you've gone before us. So we look to you for compassion and forgiveness. We cry out, save us, knowing you are able to save. When we are weak, Lord, make us strong. When hurt and resentful, make us forgiving. When defeated and discouraged, make us hopeful. Keep us from asking for mercy without giving it ourselves, from praying for your kingdom but never working for it. In this week, Lord, deepen our faith by your matchless grace. Deepen the measure of our gratitude and our obedience. Move us who have so much to share with others who have so little. Uphold us when we summon our courage to speak out for the alien and stranger within our gates and for those long denied dignity and freedom. Father, guard and guide us through these days of meditation and remembrance. Guard and guide us through all our days until we come at last to that day when all our days and journeys will be gathered into your eternity and we shall be with you forever. Glory be to you, O God. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Friends, as we're sent from this place, uh, we move into Holy Week and we move with Jesus toward Good Friday. So let's sing together, right on, right on in majesty, thy last and fiercest strife is nigh. Your father on his sapphire throne awaits his own anointed son. This is our king. This is our prince of peace. Let's praise him together.
Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go now and go into this week in his peace. Amen. Amen.